a modular rhythm machine. Um, this is a machine that I made about a year ago at MIT when I was starting my master's there. Um, I made it because I was uh, questioning, or I had questions about the kind of like the power of rhythm um, in situations, for example, like this one, where you have like a bunch of protesters in, in this is in Montreal, you know, where they take pans, pots, wooden spoons, and they just go and make noise together, you know, and it adds an additional uh, layer of power to the protest. Or situations like this one, where um, a bunch of uh, soldiers coordinate perfectly their step, and they end up making some sort of... Uh, also visually, but also sonically, like some intimidating, perfectly coordinated, rhythmic sound. Situations where, uh, for example, in rituals or ceremonies, uh, people using drums and percussion um, end up you know, entering altered states of consciousness. And you know, in the, in the end, also the drum and the percussion is an instrument that I felt was really interesting. Not only a musical instrument, but like a technological instrument, in a way. I was also thinking of the cajón. Um, the Peruvian cajón, this is a... Uh, everybody here uh, in, in this picture is um, in, a cele in celebration mode. Uh, it's in a festival in Peru called the Festival Internacional, the International Festival of Cajón. Cajón is a very simple wooden box. You sit on top and you just play it, and it makes this lovely sound. Um, and now it's used in music all over the world. Maybe some of you knew about Cajon, but you didn't know that it was kind of Peruvian. Um, it has a different origin, though. It was, never, it was not always musical. Uh, the Peruvian Cajon started as, a, as an altern, alternative way of communicating uh, by the slaves in Peru, because they were forbidden from... Uh, been together, communicating, or uh, even playing their own drums. So they started looking at the fruit crates in the fields where they worked, and, and they realized that they could have like a low-key alternative, you know, to send secret messages with the rhythms that they would play. So the Peruvian cajón definitely influenced my, my design for the single module of the modular rhythm machine. As you can see, it's also built in wood. And um, I mean, every single module has a, like a stick, a, like a drumstick attached to a motor, and then a couple of sensors, so I can use it, uh, you know, in, in many different ways to explore many different things: chaos, coordination, uh, I don't know, intensity of sound. They, they also have each module. Module also has the possibility to join other modules. So in the video, in the video that you saw in the beginning. Uh, you saw there were 36 modules, and so far now I have 48 modules, some of which are right now in display at the MIT Museum. So it's a project that keeps growing, and it keeps mutating into different shapes and different uh, explorations. Another interesting application of drums uh, comes from the Ashanti warriors, where um, with a special tool, they would scratch the top skin, and they would make a, they, they make a, imitate and reproduce the sound of a leopard to scare the enemy. So the enemy would never, they would run away right, uh, before even getting there. No. So sound in general is something that I'm very interested in, and I think uh, it has a lot of power. It has power in 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 dealing in conflict, but and also in dealing with. Uh, Union, no? but in, in, in regards to conflict and similar to the Ashanti warriors, these guys in the picture, um, they are uh, a, an army division from the United States called the Ghost Army. And um, they were a bunch of artists and designers that were together as a secret division to uh, kind of fool the Nazis. You know, so they made inflatable tanks and a bunch of other things. Um, one of which was uh, recording the sound of the whole bat battalion and putting it on top of a tank, and then going somewhere else and playing the sound from there. So the Nazis thought that the enemy was there, but yeah, actually, so they fooled the enemy and it worked. Sound has been weaponized also recently, also in in, in situations like like this one, where this policeman is carrying a long-range acoustic device, also known as a sound cannon. And um, it's basically an, a huge speaker that propels a sound that is so strong that 
it's just unbearable. It produces damage. It's, it's been labeled also as a non-lethal weapon. Um, this makes me wonder also like, how all these sound machines and these sonic technologies have always been deployed and used uh, a little bit uh, by, by the warriors or the military or the police, or sometimes the corporate, you know? Sometimes you have these sonic devices that listen to all of our conversations, uh, you know, gather data, and, 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 and you have to pay for them <laughs> inclusive. Or this other uh, mosquito ultrasonic teenage youth deterrent, you know? This is a... Um, this is a, like in shopping centers, they put this around so that the teenagers don't hang out. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so right now it's playing a sound. If you don't hear the sound, it's because you're too old. <laughs> Nobody hears the sound, huh? There is gladly alternatives and DIY communities all around the world that, I, that are doing something with sound. Um, sound system culture all over the world is super important, it's huge, and they make these amazing sound systems that especially try to discover and explore the, the low frequencies, the bass. So um, they get together and they celebrate the sound system and they celebrate their capacity to produce uh, amazing amounts of, of, of bass. Um, they also mount some sound, really important sound systems in moving vehicles, you know. Uh, and, and people just kind of like claim this, their space in the city with their music and with their sound. Um, people not only claim the space where they're standing on, but they also end up claiming a, a larger space, you know? And I think that's democratic, that's important. Especially because if people don't claim their space, somebody else will. This guy is probably a very intelligent and smart entrepreneur, and he has a motorcycle with a couple of speakers, and he's selling the occupation of the sonic space, by the minute, by the hour, or by the second. And he probably wants a couple of politicians here, or a couple of companies there that pay him money to spread the message all around the city. So, this guy will take the sonic space. These guys take the sonic space all the time with this brilliant technological device, the bell. You know, they send messages with different patterns. There's a service at, that, at a certain time. Somebody died, somebody's coming. And I think that on my side, you know, I also had to produce some sort of alternative to, to, to claim the sonic space, in a way. You know, not only the urban space where we stand, but also kind of like the bubble where all the sound arrives to. So I made a project, another project called the Speaker Tower. Um, I have a little video here. So the speaker tower, um, it's a little bit spooky and dark, but um, it's a very nice project also because then people come to you and this is MIT, right? And then MIT is full of, not really artists, uh, but MIT is full of engineers and scientists that need to understand stuff. So, so this guy came and says, asked, what, what is this? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean, what is this? And he's like, is this art? I was like, yeah, this is art. And then he just didn't worry anymore, try, not trying to understand the project. <laughs> And he was like, oh, cool, can I record it, etc. <laughs> it's a really nice playground at MIT you know, to test all of these things. Um, the speaker tower is a couple, are a couple of, um, of speakers facing opposite sides, and they just stand on top of a... Um, oh, yeah, it's moving. Uh, they stand on top of a kind of hacked uh, speaker stand that holds a battery, and it holds uh, the whole system that rotates. So um, it's important... Uh, for me to use things that one can find in the market and kind of hack them and, and reuse them. Um, and I'm going to really quickly speak about uh, another project. This is a speaker wheel. Um, and it's a speaker wheel that we made in, uh, at MIT with a bunch of other students. And it was made to just try and test uh, sound moving in space. But then it ended up claiming also like uh, the space of the protest for some reason. It was like uh, uh, trying to get there for, for some reason. So, um, hopefully you don't get dizzy with this video, but uh, 
Uh, this is me with my friend Kimberly pushing the wheel on a protest in the Boston, going from the Boston Common to the State House. Um, and uh, it was really nice to have a, an object that could empower everybody, you know, uh, not only in claiming the streets, but also trying to, you know, claim again, like, the larger sonic space. And I made another one. I thought uh, I should make one that is bigger, stronger, louder, and I used a couple of satellite dishes and I can, like pieces that one can find in a junkyard uh, to put it together, and it worked. And I also think that many people should have a speaker wheel and other devices like this, you know? <laughs> so, so I also try to, with the object itself, try to self-explain how it is constructed how it is, and how it is built. It is an open source ideology. Some of the plans of the open source are not yet online, but they will be. And I think uh, uh, all of these projects are meant to be in collaboration with everybody else, you know? Everybody should have a, uh, the same as the DIY sound systems. We have like these other sound systems that help us have a higher, louder voice and more clear messages. And that's it. Thank you very much.